I want to talk today about um, data and science and marketing. And a lot of times people don't think those all mix, but they actually do pretty well. So I want to start by taking you back. And some of you, I'm going to take you back a little further than others. Back to the time when you got your first job. So you're probably a teenager, and it's like, I got my first paper route. And you run home and you tell your parents, yay, or I got a babysitting job. You know, it's very exciting. Everyone's happy. You fast forward a few years, OK, now you've graduated. And now, eh, maybe after a job or two, you finally got that job that you know is going to be your career. All right? And you run home to tell your family. All right? This is how it went for me. So I run home. Guess what? I got the job that I know is going to be the career for the rest of my life. I am so excited. And my parents go, great, what? Marketing. What? Marketing, you know, like understanding customer segments and looking at industry trends. Um, you mean sales? No, no, no. Marketing, um, like writing data sheets and doing ads. Oh, 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 you mean like that weird subliminal advertising thing? So I realized early on in my career that marketing has a marketing problem. All right, so let's talk about that in a little more detail. So what I did is I said, let me do a little research. I want to find out what the definition, the official definition of marketing is. And I looked at the American Marketing Association and I looked at some encyclopedias. So here we have the definition, activities that direct the flow of goods and services from producers to consumers, once primarily concerned with increasing sales through advertising and other promotional techniques. Corporate marketing departments now focus on credit policies, product development. How many people fell asleep about three words into that whole definition? Okay. It's not, yeah, thank you. I got a lot of hands raised on that. It's not exactly the definition I was looking for. I searched some more and I actually ran across exactly what I needed in what has become my currently favorite marketing book called Decoded. Phil Barden just wrote it, it's The Science Behind Why We Buy. Some really great data in there, I highly recommend it. But here it is in a nutshell. Marketers influence buyer behavior. Makes absolute sense and our job is to retain customers, we need to get customers to buy more, and we then need to convert non-customers into customers. That's awesome, all right? So this is great. Why do you guys care, all right? Those of you who are not going to be in the marketing profession actually do need to care about this. Daniel Pink, in his uh, recent book called To Sell is Human, made a really great case for the fact that everybody is selling pretty much all the time. You're trying to convince your, pre your professor you're really smart. You're trying to convince um, your boss that you need a raise. You know, you're always in some kind of selling mode. The reality is, before you can get into selling mode, you need to step back and be in marketing mode. All right? And so we're going to talk about marketing mode. Think about your careers. All right? Before you decide what job you're going to take, you need to think about, well, what industry should I be in? Where is there industry growth? Where are there enough companies? Who, who actually can make use of my particularly wonderful skills? All right? This is marketing. All right? Or maybe you decide to open, I've got a lot of entrepreneurs in my, in my classes, maybe you decide to open a local pizza joint. Now you have to decide, should I be focusing my time and energy on the students to the east of me, got a lot of them over there, hungry students, or should I focus on this really large community of elderly people in this housing complex right next to my shop? It's a marketing decision. I have to figure out where are my easiest buys going to come from, and then how do I approach them with my great message? All right, so this is all marketing. This is why we care. So along the way, let's dispel some myths. Because as you saw with my parents long ago, there's some myths about marketing. So one of the big ones is marketing equals sales. It's the same thing, sales, marketing, marketing, sales. And especially in the industry I come out of, industrial automation, a lot of people think that way. All right, the reality is they are very different. All right, marketing focuses on a bigger picture. We're looking at industries. We're looking at markets, hence the term marketing. All right, we're looking at groups of customers that have common characteristics. How does that fit with the product or service we're trying to sell? Whereas salespeople are actually focusing on an individual customer and they're there to close the deal, right? Look okay. at marketing and sales, really easy. The next one is marketing equals advertising, all right? Advertising is 
a portion of what we marketers do, but it's a very small portion of what we do. And if we look at the whole picture, marketing is all about selling the right product to the right customer at the right price using a convenient channel for the customer. All right? It's the four Ps, a lot of you've heard of them, product, price, place, promotion. If you learn nothing else about marketing when you go off to do your business thing, you can do pretty well if you just remember the four Ps. All right? This is awesome. The problem is, in this day and age with the internet, Advertising is becoming less and less relevant because we're overloaded with information, right? So, so as a result, we end up with, with new behaviors that have been created like banner blindness. People don't actually see those banner ads that are on web pages. If they don't see them, how are we marketers actually going to get our message out? This is a big problem. Look at some interesting data here. So this is data that comes out of the decoded book. All right, we have how much time people spend looking at certain ads. All right, I've got, if I'm lucky, I'm running an ad in a trade magazine like a medical journal or an engineering journal, and people will spend a little over three seconds on the ad. If I'm not so lucky and I'm running a web banner ad, basically people's eyes just scrape across it one second and that's all I've got for them. All right. This is appalling. How do we get messages about all these cool new products we're creating out into the market if nobody's stopping to look at the messages that we're putting out there? Well, let's take a minute and look at the neuroscience that's happening behind the scenes. So if we look at the neuroscience, the reality is in this day and age, we have roughly 11 million bits of information bombarding our, sec our, our senses every second. That's right, I did say every second. 11 million bits every second. All right. Can we possibly function trying to actually decode and sense and figure out what we want to do with 11 million bits? No, we absolutely cannot. So we need shortcuts. All right. And this is where we get into cognitive psychology and what's going on inside the brain. How do we actually create these shortcuts that allow us to process the world around us. So now enter into the picture work from the Nobel winning psychologist um, uh, Kahneman. All right? And he's done some really fascinating work on human decision making. And he basically came up with two systems that we have. We have the autopilot and we have the pilot. It's not surprisingly the autopilot, we're really working on perception and intuition it's running all the time, it works fast, it makes decisions fast, that's great. Then we have the pilot, which is really more reflective thinking. So I stop, I pause, I look at it, I think about it, I need to make decisions, so I'm spending time on that decision. All right, this is great. We have these two systems running in the background. The problem for marketing is, again, how do we get our messages into that autopilot so that we don't have to stop and make people think every time they make a purchase, right? The reality is we want a strong brand, say Tropicana, with the orange that's sitting on the package with the straw in it, right? Everyone's seen that, right? They actually tried to change the packaging a few years ago, and they put this beautiful glass with juice poured in it. They lightened up the colors of the packaging. Anybody heard about this particular devastating change they made? Turns out it was a disaster, all right? Because people had gotten used to the brand. I see this fresh orange there. It's like drinking straight out of the orange. And when that branding symbol disappeared, people had to stop and think, wow, what kind of orange juice do I want to buy? And as soon as people have to stop and think, you run the likelihood of losing that sale, all right? So we have to figure out how to get our behaviors into this autopilot system. Easier said than done. All right, so let's look at one of the ways. I, I work in technology marketing in the high-tech world. Everyone thinks if you build a better product, the world will beat a path to your door, okay? So maybe that's one of the ways we can get people to pay attention. We create this absolutely brilliant product, all right? And they're gonna beat a path to our door and um, uh, everything will be good. Well, the problem is, according to Forbes, there are 250,000 products introduced every year, and the failure rate is 85 to 95%. This is incredibly disheartening, okay? 
And even if you're the first product into a market, it doesn't really help you. Uh, was Amazon the first online bookstore? No, books.com. Was Apple the first MP3 player? No, that belonged to, I can never remember the name of the company, Suhan something or other back in 1997. And several other companies had come onto the scene before Steve Jobs did his wonderful marketing magic. All right, so those were not the first products, yet they went on to become great successes. So what do we do then, actually? How do we, how do we actually get people's attention? All right, so what actually works here? What works is you need a good product, but you need an even better business model. And this was proven by Amazon and Apple and a whole bunch of other companies out there. So in the case of, of Apple, for instance, the iPod and the iTunes combination that came out long ago now, all right, no one thought they had a chance. All right? Apple was late to the market with the iPod, but they did something that no one else had thought of. What happened back in that, the early 2000 time frame? Anybody remember? Who, what company crashed and burned? Anybody remember Napster? All right, so Napster was free digital music. They had run around doing all sorts of great things. Everybody loved them. The problem was the music industry went after them with a bazillion lawyers and took them down. All right, so Hollywood and the music industry people were thinking, we are infallible, all right? This is early 2000s, nobody can, can take away all our money and all our music rights and all this good stuff. All right, and I can understand that whole IP thing. The problem was the demand was there for digital music and Steve Jobs knew that. So he went and did his magical sales pitch on the music people and said, listen, the demand's there, I have the technology that will help you make money and not have to spend it all on lawyers trying to take down all these new companies that are inevitably going to pop up and try to take you down. And since then, we have had things like the uh, iTunes has generated $33 billion in, in money that's gone towards the content providers. $33 billion, $9 billion of that just in 2012. All right, that's going directly to those content providers, the people making the apps, the music, the books. All right, this isn't just Apple sucking up a lot of money. So let's look at the last, um, uh, the last actual myth that I want to talk about. All right, subliminal messaging, which is one of the ones I started about. Right, my parents said, "Ooh, is that that weird subliminal advertising stuff people do?" How many people here have heard of subliminal advertising? Come on, be honest. Right, pretty much everybody here. All right, so when this came up, this was back in 1957, a market researcher named Vickery ran a series of tests in a movie, and he put in two frames that, adver that, that ran for one three thousandth of a second, all right, so there's no way you could consciously register it, but you could subconsciously, and one said, eat popcorn, and one said, drink Coca-Cola, all right? And when the ads actually, when the research came out and was publicized, what happened was the Coca-Cola sales increased 18% and the popcorn sales increased a phenomenal 57%. The world went nuts. They're like, holy cow, this subliminal thing, there's some real opportunity here. We can get it into people's subconscious. All right? The problem was Vickery lied. All right? It never happened. So he lied about the research results. He also apparently lied about whether the, um, the research took place at all. The movie theater owner, where he claims to have done the research, says, uh, nobody did anything here. I'm not sure what he's talking about. So we've got a problem. Vickery lied about the research, but he did not admit this until many years later. In the meantime, this really played into people's paranoia. Oh man, the government's going to be funneling messages into us. They're going to, they're going to put all sorts of things in the middle of shows and advertisements. Oh man, you know, this is the end of the world. This is awful. The reality is you cannot make someone buy something if it's not one of their conscious or subconscious goals. It has to be currently in context, in their frame of mind right now that it's a goal in order for you to get them to then take some kind of action. <clears throat> what that means is 
we now have to think about um, how do we get people to then take action, right? I run an ad, I want people to see the ad, I want them to then remember the brand, I want them to, when they're in the store or at a catalog, recall it, all right? And then I want them to hopefully buy, all right? There's a series of processes that happen, and I want to make sure that that happens. Well, subliminal advertising is not going to work. To this day, here we are, over 50 years later, people are still writing articles about the evils of subliminal advertising. And I'm telling you right now, it does not exist, okay? Unless you were hungry and wanted popcorn at that moment, you saw that, there's no way it would make you actually take an action. In fact, if it's not one of your conscious or subconscious goals right then, you won't even perceive the message. It'll just fly right by. All right, so I just want to make sure everyone was clear that that actually is not something that happens. All right, so as I was doing my research for subliminal advertising, I ran across this ad, all right? And it was classified as subliminal advertising. So we have Burger King, super seven-incher. We have the pretty model with the bright red lipstick, the mouth open, she's surprised. This monster sandwich on the other side of the screen, the words, it'll blow, you, or it'll blow your mind away. Is there anything subliminal about this ad? No, this is, this falls under the category of, in some cases, sex does sell. All right, so forget the whole thing about subliminal advertising. The bottom line here is, at some point in your lives, you're all going to need to be thinking about marketing, whether it's for your career, for a business you open, uh, especially with all the entrepreneurship going around these days. That's a burgeoning um, area of study in all the schools um, around the US. So you need to make sure you understand that marketing is about data and behavior. We need to understand business strategy. We need to understand psychology, neuroscience, and of course, we need to understand the behavioral economics, which is we actually make a decision, whether it's a reward or a pain. So when we look at something, does it actually stimulate the reward areas of the brain? That's a good thing, then I'll take that behavior. Or does it stimulate the pain areas of the brain? I'm then going to avoid it and not make any kind of move. So what do you think? So pricing actually stimulates the pain portion of the brain. What do you think sex stimulates in the brain? And maybe the reward portion? All right. Thank you very much. Have fun and have a great day.